Joining us, as promised before the break, a former fan favorite, um, probably a forever fan favorite, Jose Calderon, former Raptors point guard, second all-time in Raptors assists. If you're a, you don't have to be a longtime Raptor fan. Everyone knows who Jose is. Numero Ocho. What's going on, Jose? Hey, how are you guys? We are, we are doing really well. We're doing really well. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We wanted to talk about um, your time with the Raptors, kind of go back a little bit and just go through your career. We wanted to talk, obviously, with you about Spanish basketball as well. Um, and then just a couple of assorted questions um, that have really come up recently. But, um, yeah, if, you, if you're good with that, I would like to start with your time in Toronto. And, and of course, you came here uh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, but do you remember how big of a culture shock was it when you first came to the NBA? It was a little bit. It was a little bit. Uh, the biggest uh, issue for me was more than anything was the, my language. I think it was uh, I was playing a few times. Uh, I talk about the story about, you know, calling plays and people don't understand. And so it was a little bit hard. <laughs> you know, we, we have to switch from uh, voice calls to just signs because people felt more comfortable with, uh, with the signs. Uh-huh. So it was a struggle. It was a struggle. That first year was tough. Uh, we had a great, uh, you know, great teammate. It's true that they helped me a lot. But being a point guard uh, coming from Europe and uh, not really speaking a lot of English, that was um, probably the, or the biggest shock of all. Uh, even like, you know, uh, I think Toronto is a, it, probably the more American city, but still more European than anything else. So for me, that helps. And it was a great adjustment right away. Yeah. Um, did you have any funny moments uh, in terms of like a, a language barrier or I know you spoke English, just, just not maybe as strongly as you do now. Um, but did you have any funny moments of misunderstanding with players about uh, just, again, that language gap? There's two things. Once uh, at the beginning when they were laughing in the locker room, I wasn't sure if they were laughing about me or from, the, you know, of me. Or So they laugh, I laugh. So, But I have no idea. So maybe that's why they were like, oh, this guy is cool because they, he's just laughing. But I didn't <laughs> yeah. really know what was going on in the locker room. And after the, the second one was when one, one play that uh, it was called diagonal. Uh-huh. Um, and I couldn't, you know, it was diagonal, di- diagonal, diagonal, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I look back from half core, you know, I'm trying to, to call the play, and my four teammates are looking at each other like, what's the play? Like, what, what are we supposed to be doing now? Yeah. So since that day, you know, some Mitchell just changed everything. We went to a fist up, uh, two down, <laughs> horns up, and that's it. That was the end of the of that play until uh, my English got a little bit better. Yeah, things that are a little bit easier uh, signal with, with hands. I get it. Um, so I think uh, for a lot of fans, people are remembering about um, – you know, your point guard partnerships. I feel like every single year when you were with the Raptors, the Raptors also brought on other point guards to help run the point with you, but also sometimes to try to compete with you. And I know that, um, you know, obviously you stuck it out for a long time. Again, you're second in Raptors assists. That's, I think that speaks for itself, the longevity. But talk to me about um, uh, playing with TJ Ford and, and starting a point guard. Those The two of you guys sort of trading off on that job. Yeah, it was great. I mean, for me, it was always, always good. You know, all these, uh, my teammates, I always had great relationship with all of them because at the end of the day, it was about the team for me. Um, so with TJ, same thing. He came, he was a starting pointer uh, my second year. So for me, it was great. It was a, uh, just uh, keep learning from guys who've been in the league, uh, around the league, and a great player who, you know, who was able to score in a lot of ways. I was completely the opposite, so I think it was a good tandem for, for that team. Um, and that was kind of like the thing. He got injured, so I replaced him for uh, the starting position, and after from that, you know, uh, is when the Raptors in the third year, they decide to to get me as a, as a starting point guard. But, uh, but yeah, but, I mean, for me, it was always that challenge of uh, being, you know, being together, trying to to play the best I could. And I think usually the the players that they were coming in uh, to play my position were just a different style of players. So it was perfect. I think you always think uh, talk about okay, this is great for the team. He can score more. I can pass better or whatever. So that was for me always the key. And um, and TJ was that. Uh, I still maintain relationship with him. Oh, nice. uh, it was a great tandem. We went to the playoff. It was a great season. And you know. Uh, just the bad luck of him getting that injured that, you know, is him down a little bit because for us was a really important piece on, on that team. Yeah, I, I'm personally, I'm still mad at Al Horford. Every time I see him, I, I, I back in my mind, I'm like, but you heard TJ Ford. And I know it wasn't on purpose, but I, yeah. I still get a little upset about it. I, I remember, um, you know, reading a story. This is, again, so long ago, but I think TJ, you actually went to the coaching staff and you said TJ should start. And you actually yeah. volunteered yeah. to come off the bench. Can you tell me about that story? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we, you know, TJ came back from the injury. The, the team was playing really good, so the, the you know, coaches decided to stay the way that that way and bring in TJ from from the bench. But you know, it was two things. Like he wasn't comfortable on that, you know, with his role. Uh, you know, everybody was kind of like waiting for him to to be back as himself, and I, I thought it was the best way of like, look, I know I've been playing good. I know the team is playing great, but. But we need TJ. We need more people to be able to get to what we want it to be. And we were fighting to to get the, that Atlantic Division title and everything like that. So uh, for me, it was like I always say, I mean, for me, always the team was first. So yeah. this is not about number or stats. So I thought that was a good thing for, for our team and, and for TJ as well. Just, you know, that's his role. That that's, He was the starting pointer. I was just replacing him. And uh, I was just getting back to uh, our regular, you know, stats, if you could say that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I think first off, you know, a, a lot of players would want to continue to start, especially if the, the team's successful. But I think that's what you're talking about. You've always put the team first. And, you know, again, the, the team did try a couple different other point guards, especially after TJ got hurt. Jared Jack was brought in, Jared Bayless. I think, you know, some of these other names, but it, it didn't really quite work out. It was usually the coach would always come back to you. Um, and it wasn't until Kyle Lowry came through where it was like, okay, finally, I think the Raptors can maybe pivot in a different direction. And unfortunately, obviously, that led to um, you getting moved off the team. But um, I was actually, we had Dwayne Casey on the show uh, earlier this week. And Dwayne was telling us a story about Kyle, especially the way he was when he was early on in his career, was so, so competitive. And he just, he, in his words, he, Kyle was trying to kick your ass in practice every single day when he was coming off the bench against you. What can you tell us about uh, competing against Kyle, even within the same team? Ah, it was great. I mean, uh, I love Kyle. He's been a great, a great friend since since those days. Uh, I think the good thing I, I brought to the table is like they understood that you could compete against me as many times as you want, like uh, because it's good for the team. Uh, that doesn't mean we cannot be friends and or be even best friends uh, outside of the of those lines. So that was always me. That's the way I am as a person. So the competitive, like, it was great. I mean, I was learning. I was uh, growing. Uh, he was making me a better player. I was trying to make him a better player. He listened. He understood that I, you know, every time I was saying something, it was to help, not to trying to get anything wrong about it. Yeah. So uh, that that was the trust that was there, and you know a lot of things happened. You know at that time I was uh, as well my expiring contract. Uh, I was playing really well at that time. So you know it was Rudy Gay was they were able to get Rudy Gay on that trade. Yeah. So it was more than just you know giving Kyle the, the keys. It was just the situation of everything, and I yeah. think that was a good a good thing for the team, a good thing for everybody. I think Kyle deserved to be where where he you know the starting pointer for that team. I think you know he was a different player when he arrived and when he. Uh, when I, when I left, and uh, I mean, look what happened after that. So it was it was great, great to see that growth of, of Kyle in Toronto. Yeah, I um, I, I think are are you and Kyle friends? Like, I feel like I, th I think I saw something where you wanted a reporter to tell Kyle to to answer your text or something like that. This is maybe back in yeah. 2015. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was in the last, I think it was the last All Star or something. I don't know okay. what it was. No, the finals. I think it was when he played the finals. That was last year, no? No. Yeah, with Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think Miami, it was yeah. in Miami. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I'm like, look, I just ask this. And uh, yeah, we, he has spent some time in, in Spain as well. We're always in contact. Uh, oh, I nice. I'm in contact with Demar, with a lot of the guys. So, like I say, it was always a good relationship, even like from the outside, people maybe were thinking something else or trying to, to figure something out for yeah. us was, you know, about the team. I was trying to help them. I am so, you know, happy with them and the career that they have after those years uh, with me. So I love it. It was, it was always great. Uh, speaking of DeMar, what do you remember about a young DeMar when he first came in? Because he came in super young, right? 19, and you were with him for the first, I think, three or four years. What do you remember about the young DeMar DeRozan? Well, I remember that he actually was probably the opposite of what he is right now. You know, like he was a raw talent that couldn't really uh, shoot the ball. Super athletic. He is still being athletic, but he doesn't, doesn't use it that much. But now he came to, uh, yeah, he, he went to the other way. Like, so... Uh, Finesse, finesse, uh, playing great. I mean, that ball work. Uh, he can not miss a shot every time he shoots from two. And, and he had his own style. You know, he didn't get into the 
what happened with the three-point line or the new NBA. He keep playing his way. He's up there in the scoring uh, history of the NBA, and he still have a, a few years to go. So yeah. I think it was that same thing. A guy who was able to work, to listen, to to really get better, and uh, wanted to be better, and wanted to be the best he could be. I mean, impressive uh, career what, he, what he's having for sure. Yeah, for sure. You could definitely tell how much hard work he put into that, right? Because I remember young Demar, just like um, obviously you, you played with him, but it was like exactly what you mentioned. It was very raw, but to see him now and how skilled he is, the footwork, the the touch that he has on his shot is incredible. But I think also something that takes a lot of hard work is is, is leading the league in free throws. Um, and uh, 2009, you were at 98.1 percent on the season, 151 for 154. I'm sure you get asked about this probably more than almost anybody yeah. gets asked about free throw shooting. But in that year, and I know you, your longest streak, I believe, was 87 consecutive, which I think is the second longest streak ever in NBA yeah. history. Um, you made 87 for 87 at one point. Was that in the back of your mind? Did you ever, like, when you ever stepped to the free throw line for, like, a technical or you got fouled or whatever, did you ever get, like, is that in the back of your mind? Like, I can't miss this. Not just because I need the points, but, like, I have, like, an NBA record going. It was, it was there, but it was because it was getting bigger and bigger of a story, um, and that was the problem too, uh, in a sense, because players start talking about it. Players were joking around, "Hey, I, I yeah. got a hundred dollars that you're gonna miss. <laughs> I got a hundred that you will, I got a hundred that will you will get to uh, to one hundred uh, yeah. before you miss." Uh, so people start talking about it. Some teams too. I remember going into Sacramento, mm -hmm. uh, go to the line, and actually the guys from the arena just telling everybody, like, "Look, this guy got fifty-four or fifty-five on a row." Oh. Let's get, let's make him me. So people went crazy about when I was going to the line in some places. So, so that was the whole thing about it. So I remember my three misses. Um, okay. It was an impressive, uh, impressive year that I, you know, never get even close to that uh, because uh, thinking now about it is like it's almost impossible. Like I didn't, yeah. I, I wasn't a huge free throw shooter like a uh, number wise. So it was even more difficult because some nights I went Hollywood one and after maybe three one day or four or whatever and zero for two games. So, yeah. so it was difficult to uh, to keep it that way. But you know, it was a scene that it was there. I was trying to focus on the whole thing and just uh, it was. Uh, I remember the last game. Mm -hmm. I remember coaches telling me like, "Don't go to the line tonight. Just just shoot from the outside." <laughs> it was a, it was a game. It was a game that didn't mean anything to us before. Uh -huh. uh, I think it was I don't know. But uh, the guy, the, the coach is like, no, you have an amazing, like, don't. And I went, actually, it was 4-4-4 four, four, four or something. Oh, wow. Nice. But they were like, don't, don't, don't get it. It's the last game of the season. Don't, don't, come, don't mess it up now after all these games just uh, yeah. making free throws. So I remember some of those stories. For sure. I think, I think it's still the NBA record for highest percentage in, uh, for free throws in the season. 98.1 is just, is, is just crazy to look at when you, when you go to your, uh, when you go to your basketball reference page. Um, I wanted to ask about um, your time with the Spanish national team as well. I know um, one thing, you know, Canada is doing a lot better recently, and, and actually Canada made the Olympics finally, the men's side, finally made the Olympics by beating Spain um, in, the, in, the, in the World Cup last summer, so I'm sorry about that. But um, I know that uh, the coaches, um, both the men's and the women's team, have spoken so much about how much they want to emulate the system that you guys were able to bring in Spain in terms of the connectivity from the youth level to the, the national team and just maintaining that identity throughout um, and being able to sort of put players into these systems that, that they can really thrive and be comfortable in their role. Um, you know, when you hear that, when you hear that kind of respect um, given to the national program that you guys had with Spain, how does that make you guys feel? And, and how special was it to, to play under um, just some really glorious generations with uh, Spanish basketball? I mean, it's great. And I think that's, that's the... I like the, the the pride or being proud of what we did more than anything, no? more than winning or getting medals or go to the Olympics. I think for for a long time we were able to be competitive and play for every every medal, every trophy, and that was something important. The second thing of it, would you say about the Spanish and the coaches as well that now in Canada, it's about for us going to uh, to uh, play for Spain. It wasn't like. I'm missing my summer. Uh, this is vacation for me. It was actually something that we love and we embrace as something great. Uh, instead of going work out in summer, it doesn't matter, Miami, LA, or whatever, uh, we were working out with the best. I was working out every summer with Pau Gasol, with Mar Gasol, with Navarro, with uh, Rudy Fernandez, with all those guys. Like It's like, why instead of being by myself, I cannot be here having fun? So we were like a family. We love each other. Uh, our families came to visit and instead of like going 
going with our families. We just, our family was the one joining the group. So that's kind of like chemistry that we have. Uh, it gets us to win a lot of championships that other teams didn't have that chemistry, that good feeling with each other. Um, we didn't have, we never had the feeling of, wow, this is another summer that you're going to lose just, I cannot be, you know, on the beach or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we actually, you know, love to hang out with each other. And that, that was key for sure. I think, you know, that's the chemistry that you guys saw, you know, on the court as well. I think that that directly translated. You guys had such a great style, and I think it was such a distinct advantage because, you know, you look at some of the most historic games, and you think back to 2008 in Beijing, right? You guys uh, played the yep. gold medal match against uh, Team USA. First off, what do you remember about playing that match? Because it got really close. It was really intense. Like, do you ever think back on it? Because I, it might be a little bit painful, but I, I think you guys had a real chance to even take gold on that. No, in no, no, not at all. I mean, not painful. I think we lost against an amazing team uh, in 08. I think it was a little bit more painful 2012 because we actually thought we could beat them mm. after we lost the first time. So I think the second silver medal four years later, that was actually most painful than the first one. The first one, we were so happy to be able to get to the final. It was our first time going into that. It was our first uh, Olympic uh, medal. That is impressive. Some, you know, always something that you always dream as a kid to have an Olympic medal. doesn't matter which color. Of course. Uh, so we were... You know, we were upset because we lost, but we were so happy with, with the whole performance of the team and being able to to uh, cut that. Now, 2012 was a different story, uh, another close game. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at it, it really uh, from perspective, they have an amazing team. It's yeah. impossible to stop all of those guys. Yeah. They saw with you stop, you know, LeBron, and it was D-Wade, or yeah. it was Chris Ball, or it was Kobe Bryant, or it was <laughs> Carmelo Anthony. And like, yeah, you cannot, yes. you know, all of them having a bad day it was tough. And we almost got it. So that was the positive thing about it, that we always talk. Uh, for us, maybe it was the one thing that we missed, having an Olympic gold, Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. We end up with three medals. Yeah. That is amazing, but we always lost against the U.S. Uh, and that's right. the only the only little thing we were able to get the world cup that's no problem uh we got it mm -hmm. but those olympics uh, you know they always those let's say the first teams if you could say that from the, the u.s it's always mm -hmm. always uh tough to beat and uh but they were scared you could see the redeem team they could say whatever they want to say mm -hmm. but it was closer than when they were saying there oh for sure <laughs> Because I think, when I think back, and, and I remember watching it so closely because I'm Chinese, and it was the Olympics in Beijing. It was such a big, big deal, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think back to the USA team, and it looked unbeatable. I think when they played other teams, it was like they were beating them by 30. But, yeah, it, it was it was close in the fourth quarters, and you guys had a lot of yeah. great moments against them. And, you know, it was really Kobe. I think, I don't know about you, but for me, watching the games, it was like Kobe really took over for that group. And, it, yeah. and a team full of stars, it was actually him that, that took over. Was that yeah. your experience as well? Yeah, yeah, as well. But but I could see, you know, looking at the bench, at the other bench, their faces, their reactions. I I knew them. I, I knew them from the NBA. Yeah. I know how they were playing and reacting with other teams. So we felt that they were like, okay, guys, mm. this is real. Uh, this is getting close. And uh, these guys are yeah. probably, you know, better than we were expecting. Or even if we were expecting that be good, they're actually playing good as well. Yeah. So that was the whole experience. Um, but it was great. I mean, right. great challenges. Uh, we try everything. Uh they they came back with yeah that those big threes and all that stuff so that was good I mean the, an amazing experience uh, for us uh, having three Olympic medals is something you know you cannot have like a dream even about it so yeah. even if it wasn't the the most precious one but uh, I think it was good enough. Um, I wanted to ask about two of your teammates on those on those teams. Um, number one with Marcus All. Uh, so obviously you won the championship with the Raptors. Very beloved player here in Toronto. Actually Toronto's had a lot of good Spanish players as well. Shout out to um, Jorge Garbajosa as well. Also, a really yeah. good Raptor until he got injured. Um, but yeah, with with Mark getting going into retirement, it, um, you know, what is he going to do next? I, I saw the big Instagram post that he made. So has that been announced? What Mark is going to do next? And and do you still keep in touch with Mark? Yes, we talk a lot, all of us. Uh, Mark actually owns a team in Girona. He's yes. the president there, so he had a lot of like little things and other businesses, but. That's his main job, being the president. He was the president, owner, and um, player at some point. Uh, you yeah. know, the last year that he played, but he did, he just did decided to just stay on the on the front office and not be on the court anymore. So that that's the the kind of the official retirement thing. But we all knew that that last year was his last playing, and uh, that this year it was going to be difficult for us to see him back on the court. So he's doing great, uh, amazing career as well. We talk a lot. We all that generation are really good friends. We're so close that um, that is like you know it's just uh, tough not to uh, 
to enjoy now the even the you know what everybody's doing after after basketball. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask about Ricky Rubio as well. Um, um, you know, he's he's opened up about his struggles recently as well. I just want to know if you've you've checked up on R Ricky. How is he doing? And I understand he's gone back to Europe. Yes, I mean, uh, I've been in touch a lot because, uh, you know, I'm I'm part of the front office in Cleveland, so he was part right, of our of team course. as well, and, yeah. and a friend, so I was really close with the whole the whole scene, and, you know, the, the best part about all of this, like, he's really happy, he's back on the court, he's playing with Barcelona, he played a couple of games with the national team in this, uh, the FIBA window, so uh, he's back, I mean, he's smiling again, that's what we wanted to see, and uh, me as a friend, you know, like, uh, so that's, that's the, the, the main part, so uh, taking him playing last night, uh, it was great I, as well. I was watching a little bit of a Euroleague game, and uh, so nice. So it happened to uh, to all of us. Uh, you know, you got to be always uh, taking care of not just your body but your your mind as well. And and I think that's uh, special. And he came out in one moment that maybe not a lot of people were able to do, like right before going to a main event with Spain and, and be the, the main guy. And he decided to, look, I need some time and go home. And, and he, uh, I think he for sure will help a lot of people in a, in a lot of uh, different sectors of the life because I think this is not just professional sport. It's uh, any, any people in any kind of work. Uh, I think it's important to being able to take care of, uh, of their mind as well. Yeah, it was very it was very brave for Ricky to, to, to put himself out there like that and explain himself. And I know it's not easy. I think in sports all we really... We, f we focus so much on delivering results and how are you going to be on the court and, and what are you doing to, to win the next game. But I think when you take a step back and you see moments like that, that was a real courageous thing that, that Ricky did. I, I'm curious, especially from your side with the Cavs, like w what are some of the ways that Cleveland and, and you guys in the front office and or as an organization did to support Ricky in this time? Everything, everything that he asked for, you know, just trying to, to have as many resources that he needed. Uh, just putting on, on, you know, hey, whatever you need here, they are all these resources for you. If there is a space, if there is whatever, you know, if I think it was just, you know, uh, okay, Ricky, what, what's next? What you need to uh, to get back to yourself? How we can help? Uh, I think that's the first, the first thing you can do with uh, in a situation like that. There is no anything else. The the contract is a uh, is secondary. The, whatever it is, is more about the person, relationship, and just trying to do the right thing for him to be back to whatever he needed to be. And, you know, you never know if it was going to be a month, a year, or, or, or three years, or two days. It doesn't matter. It was about him, and, and that's what we were trying to do from the beginning. It's just like, okay, we're here for you, and let us know what, what do we need. We have all these resources for you. Uh, let us know if you need any of them, or if you need some extra ones, mm -hmm. we'll be ready for you as well. So. All right. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm happy to see he's still playing too. Because again, going back to 08, just the, the the image of <laughs> Ricky with the very long hair, and he was like 18 years old, just just a boy, and he was competing against like again Team USA and and running the group and going up against like Jason Kidd, who I think at that point might have already been 30. Yeah. Uh, impressive, impressive player for sure. Um, I wanted to uh, ask in actually finally just a couple of other ones. Um, I, I read a story recently that the Cavaliers kept calling you a billionaire. Back when you played on the Cavs, yes. yes, because there's a there's a there's a Mexican uh, billionaire uh, also named Jose Calderon. Now you guys are obviously not related at all. You're Spanish, he's Mexican, uh, but it became something a running joke. So tell tell us about this. Yeah, it was it was a mistake by uh, I think it was Wikipedia or something. I, oh, I guess okay. uh, everything started with Johnny Fry. Uh, <laughs> I guess he looked up uh, my name or something, uh -huh. and he saw up that I was worth you know two point or whatever billions. <laughs> So then he started to talk to everyone. So we weren't going for dinner, and he will be like, "Hey, the, you know, the billy, the billionaire is not to pay." <laughs> so, so the whole thing, you know, broke up. Everybody was joking with each other. Yeah. Everybody was talking that even ESPN have a, a note about it just to explain for everybody that they, they know. But some players, same thing that with the free throws, some, some players were like, "Are you really billionaire? Why you why you are playing basketball?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Look, it's not me." Not me. I play <laughs> basketball because it's fun. So it's not like yeah. people were thinking like I was just playing just because and uh -huh. that I didn't need the boy. It wasn't money or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was going on for a while until you know uh, we had I had to answer some question to uh, to uh, one of the all the reporters and say, look, this is how it happened. It's Channing Fry he was the one to start it. Uh, it was it, it's, it's true like if you look at it, yeah. it says that I was worth that money. But you know uh, I was playing. Look, this is not me. Uh, same name, my family, whatever, but nothing to do with uh, with my family. Even with that, they were always like, "Yeah, yeah, right, whatever." Of yes. course. <laughs> so, 
So it's always it, it was fun. It was a great story to to go with, with the season. Yeah. Well, hey, listen. If you were a billionaire, you may do something like this. You you may own a a ham farm, and I think that this is always a story I always wanted to ask you about. You do you own a, do you still own your ham farm? It was it wasn't like I explained this one too. Okay. I have a ham business, but it wasn't like I I own you know all all, all the stuff. Like the thing was, I was with people like. Uh, uh, business and we were actually bringing some of the the ham, the pata negra, that that's you know a different uh -huh. kind of ham that it was it was going to Toronto. I brought olive oil as well and some other things. Oh, you were like just about food. That. Yeah, like so it wasn't business. just like that. Okay. But I didn't have, but I didn't have like the you know the real pigs with me or anything like that. It was just uh -huh. you know part of. It was a whole. It was a lot of farmers where we you know we yeah. usually use with them and work with them, but we were in the other side of things. Like I didn't own. But uh, that people love that. Yeah. I stick with that. I remember even the Raptors putting it in the in one of the media books. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, let's go, guys! Like, I'm you know, I'm just I'm not have a farm. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but it was fun. Yeah. So you're not a billionaire, and you do not feed pigs for the purposes yes. of, of curing ham later on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So the worst was uh, yeah, fake news. Fake news. That's fake news. <laughs> well, okay. I think this one's real. Um, you were in attendance for Kawhi shot in Game Seven. Can you tell us? Um, first off, were you in good attendance, and also what brought you to Toronto for it? And what was your what was your, where were you sitting when when Kawhi hit that shot? Uh, it was uh, I was a four row, oh. uh, actually on that on that basket, and this is what happened. It was probably was a timeout right before that play. So me and my son, because we needed to get back to uh, I think we were in Detroit at that time. So we have a car waiting outside. So uh -huh. we were like, okay, let's go to the tunnel. So on that time, I was actually on the tunnel okay. uh, where the players go, trying to get to my car. You know, like watching from there. What, you didn't see it? People, uh, no, no, we oh. see it, but it was like the craziest. Uh, <laughs> as soon as it was like bounce, 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 I was like, whoa. Okay, and I was to my son, Manuel, run. <laughs> <laughs> so we went down to the to the parking, like uh, a stab, and, uh, and we were just following the, the party and everything with the little yeah. screens that they were in the... Uh -huh. at, the, at the arena yeah. so um, so it was yeah it was amazing so it was so so much fun yeah that that is so much fun all right last last question um uh so uh, kobe obviously got the his statue unveiled outside of uh well what used to be staples what is now crypto arena and on that the uh, the statue of, of kobe after 81 he put the one finger up and that's the the figurine that they've used and yeah. there's the box score that's been inscribed onto the statue underneath. And it has, obviously, the players who played in that game. It was against Toronto, of course, and you were one of the players. They actually misspelled your name on that box score. They spelled I, it Jose Calderson with, yeah, <laughs> with an that. S as well. Um, first off, they got it corrected. But, yeah, do you just remember being in that game, first and foremost? Yes. I, for me, I always it's, it, I always took it the, the right way in a sense like I was – witness to history mm -hmm. so always from the beginning yes uh, i was on the other side of things that you know it's always better if you're on the other side but uh, but i love it i always joke yeah. around look i i got him a few times he was one of one out of three so 33 percent on my on with my difference oh so i was trying to you know so it was it was always great i always took it like a really nice yeah. fun way of like this that that was amazing i knew that was gonna be a history for sure mm -hmm. um so it was it was great and i always remember with kobe too when we play each other you know years later because that was my rookie season mm -hmm. so for me it was always like oh, okay look this is what happened and you know i always joking around so it was great and um and with the uh, with the other part that you say about the statue and everything i was there like a month ago or a month and a half ago so i went to take some pictures and i was there just walking around but i didn't want to be the one uh, bring it up or making it viral <laughs> so but i saw it i got the picture i'm like wow these guys what happened is I didn't realize the others, the couple of mistakes that yes. uh, that they were there. So I felt a little bit better that it wasn't just me, that uh -huh. it's at least there is another two yeah. uh, little things there. So, but it's okay. I mean, it's something that it was another great story to tell. Uh -huh. um, it was hard, and uh, for sure, I, I, I guess in something as important as it is, for sure they will try to to fix it. It's something that will be there for forever uh, to remember someone like Kobe. So everything got to be perfect, like he was in that yeah. sense and that game. And um, but I mean, that, even like that, like even if they keep it as Calderson, uh -huh. because you know I I'm, I got an American passport now, so that's all right too. So. <laughs> Yeah. Even with that, even with that, uh, I would take it any 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 day. So, yeah. so it was always always good. Yeah. Well, I, again, I remember because I've been a long time Raptor fan. You guys were up. The Raptors were up. 
you know, for, yep. for a large part. That's why Kobe had to score so often because they, you know, they were not playing well and he was the only guy who could score. But my question always is why did you guys not try double teaming, triple teaming? You know what I mean? At a certain yeah. point, like, did you guys yeah, try those everything? Things? You tried everything? We tried everything when they started getting back to uh, to the game and he was uh, keep scoring and scoring. At the beginning, we were okay with it in a sense of like you winning. Yeah. Kobe is the only one scoring. Everybody yeah. else is like not having their night. So yeah, let's keep doing this way. The problem was he's scoring too much. <laughs> the game gets tight. Yeah. He, they go in front, but you just try to do everything and it was impossible. He was pulling out from just as soon as he was uh, passing half court even. So, so it was crazy. It was uh, impossible to stop at that point okay. uh, when we wanted to do anything else it was just it doesn't matter like double team whatever there is some images always i remember of some of us playing defense on him yeah. it was a perfect defense and yeah. he has caught over you uh, or you know fouls everything it was impossible so yeah but the was, game plan was, was to let kobe yeah. score and at least to start the game the game plan was let him score but we take away everything else and then you guys were up it's just he kept scoring yeah. and then you couldn't get him to stop okay Yes, okay. uh, and, uh, I mean, not not like the game plan was like that, but I mean, okay. he was scoring and we were and we were up. Okay. So you're like, what are you going to change? You have to controlling the game. The game is under control. Just keep going mm. <laughs> until it wasn't under control. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. that happens. It happens with, with all-time players, all-time greats. Well, Jose, uh, thank you so much for doing this. And I actually, I understand you're, you're coming to Toronto next week, right? Yes, I'll be there for the West Park uh, Foundation tournament, yeah. There you go. Awesome. Well, I hope yeah, you always enjoy you. your time back in Toronto, and thank you for your time. Perfect. No, no problem. Anytime. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. Jose Calderon.